you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a real pleasure for all of us. Uh, uh, just a couple of words of thanks before I, I proceed to the conceptual side. Um, first and foremost to our director, uh, Christian Desay, who, who runs the place with elegance and innovation, uh, which is relevant to tonight. Uh, I'm most grateful to him, to his assistants, uh, to my colleagues, as heads of programs, and most of all to the jury members. I know you worked very, very hard to, to judge. We were kind, but not too kind this year. We gave you 29 to look at out of 144. I promise some of you will do, it, will do 10 next year. Um, so we'll do the screening, because it's a lot of work. And to be fair to these very elegant uh, proposals, I think we, uh, we have to minimize the work. Uh, so, the idea came from our program, and thanks to Christian, he was immediately supported it. And what I was looking for, I'm a neuroscientist by training. I, I, I look at human nature uh, without being too reductionist or deterministic. So, I allow human nature to be malleable, but I also understand the neurobehavioral foundations and predilections of man, which I think is critical for policy. Uh, so my program, we look at geopolitics, and we look at global futures, which is about five to ten years over the horizon. We can't be too fancy and go beyond that, because I think then you, you just, uh, you're just dreaming. Um, and the idea is that we recognize that the state is the most pivotal unitary actor in the global system. There's no question about that. And will likely be so for the, for the foreseeable future. But the world has changed and it has changed in a significant way, primarily because of globalization, uh, uh, which happened primarily because of the information and communication technology revolution in the 90s. Uh, now that has, has made the world instantly connected, it had, but, and it has made it interdependent, which is a good thing. Um, now, of course, uh, that has created all kinds of opportunities, but all kinds of challenges. Um, and there's all kinds of movements, as you're aware of recently, with the recent political events of counter-globalization. Uh, uh, and of course, with globalization, you get liberalism, which is a good thing. Um, uh, so we have uh, the world in general, I think, since the dawn of history, is less violent than it's ever been. Uh, I know we see it on TV every day. We see a lot of difficulties, but it's nowhere near what it has been throughout human history. Uh, I mean, on European soil, just 70 years ago, about 100 million dead or, or maimed uh, uh, through two world wars. Um, I mean, one human life is too much, and we must aspire to minimize human suffering and, and killing anywhere, anytime. But to put it in perspective, and so globalization, there's a great deal of movement with the Brexit, with the US elections, as some of you, are, I'm sure, are uh, have followed intensely. There is a counter-globalization movement. There is a counter-liberalism movement. Uh, um, and that's because of um, two things. Because of the way we are wired. It turns out that actually from a, a primordial um, uh, neurobehavioral standpoint, we are wired to be afraid. Uh, uh, we have a small organ right here called the amygdala, which is the size of an almond, which is the sort of the, the command and control of all of our fears. Um, and it doesn't take much to trigger that. And populist leaders have done it throughout human history, uh, where they push the right kind of buttons and we all retreat into this, what we call in, in neuropsychological terms, a very defensive postures because we're afraid, we, uh, we don't know uh, what's at stake. So what is constant is human nature. Uh, to me, human nature uh, is, I've called man, an emotional, amoral egoist. So, uh, and I think we are far more emotional than we think we are. And it turns out actually from a, an experimental standpoint that our most rational decisions are actually intertwined with emotionality, knowingly or unknowingly. So I think that's important to know. At best, we are amoral creatures, uh, which means our moral compass is governed uh, primarily by our perceived emotional self-interest. And, and the prefix of perceived is quite critical because you can perceive incorrectly. 
and you can sabotage uh, your very uh, your own self-interest unknowingly of course so fear is a profound motivator of behavior uh, it has always been throughout human history and will remain so um, now you marry that with this instant connectivity that we have in the world uh, uh, and with identity issues you know a lot of the counter there have been some studies, and my own analysis of this is that a lot of the counter-globalization, counter-liberal ideas are, are perceived as a threat to identity or micro sub-identity in some piece of geography somewhere else. Um, and the reason for that is that, uh, don't, don't ever forget that two things. One is that uh, identity issues are highly emotional enterprises extremely viscerally emotional, regardless of what you think about somebody else's identity. It, it, it defines, and there are reasons for that. One, it defines who you are, your own self-image. But more importantly, interestingly, and sinisterly, it, um, it is intertwined with what we call ancestral loyalty. So you feel you have to go to the extra mile to subscribe to a, 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 a a, a set of ideas called cultural frameworks or subcultural frameworks, even if you don't quite uh, subscribe to them cognitively because of some ancestral connectivity. So that's important to know. And the diaspora, interestingly, are more, uh, uh, more inclined to be ancestrally loyal than, than not. So th this is critical. You see it every day in global politics. Um, the other thing is we must never be complacent, uh, I think I've said that before, we must never be complacent about the virtues of human nature. I mean, people in this room, you're all wonderful, good creatures, but uh, very sensible and responsible. But I guarantee you that if, if there was any uh, overwhelming stress, uh, we may behave quite differently. Because this protoplasm, this piece of protoplasm is, in, is in, entrusted with what we call pro-survival acts. Everything we do is really pro-survival. We may not know it, whether it's power, whether it's money, whether it's uh, scholarship. Uh, um, and, and it's critical not to underestimate the, the ability of human nature to diverge to some dark places that uh, even the most sensible people think is impossible to do. Now you add to that this technological innovation, which is the relevance, uh, relevant to tonight. Um, we have uh, an exponential growth of all kinds of stuff. Artificial intelligence, for example, something we're interested in in our program. AI um, is an exceedingly um, useful, but potentially very dangerous enterprise. Uh, I mean, you're, you're aware of the uh, Hawkings and all those warnings about uh, what we call runaway technology, because uh, this is this has the potential of what we call runaway technology and may get away from us, uh, because if it's smart enough, uh, it may end up writing its own source code, in which case we will have little or no control over it. Now you marry that with what we call big data, or commonly known recently as colossal data, because it's, it's no it's no longer big; it's colossal. That's the actual terminology uh, being thrown around now. And you then, you have a real problem of, um, of identifying the fine line between the state need to know uh, to keep us all secure, and how the hell do you balance that with privacy and civil liberties uh, for your populace? Now, I've always maintained uh, that privacy is dead. May it rest in peace. I think it, it's over. Uh, there's no more privacy. And you and I are defined increasingly by our online presence, whether you know it or not. Uh, uh, you are defined by some AI entity, by what you click on or not click on, how often, when, three in the morning, like some tweet and, and, and uh, others. Um, so that's important to know, and you can delete it, but somebody else doesn't delete it, you know, so it makes you feel better having deleted your search history, but uh, it's over. Um, now you marry that with big data or colossal data, and uh, you, you have the potential for some very useful things for in terms of security uh, work, but also I think we, we really have to be careful as a global community not to compromise our civil liberties. Because if we do that, we, we're in deep trouble. 
Um, and I think if we reach a certain level, it will be irreversible. Um, even the most accountable of societies, you know, the, um, I've called in some of my writings, uh, even liberal democracies, what I call overseeing the overseers. So you cannot have, uh, even in parliamentary democracy or Jeffersonian democracy, people who are from within to oversee. Of course, the problem with that is betting and, and security clearance and all that good stuff. But I think it's critical that we find a societal mechanism that it doesn't compromise the data that you're supposed to oversee, um, but to make sure that governments uh, don't overreach uh, uh, into people's civil liberty. Because if we do, they do that, I think we all lose. And we may lose more as we go further. Um, and it's critical uh, in our globalized, connected world that um, uh, we must never um, forget uh, that we have to keep everybody under the tent. And I've always said uh, that nobody is too distant, too different, or even too dysfunctional to be left behind. You cannot do that anymore in our globalized world because it will, it will come back to haunt you. Uh, now, you know, the, the sort of sexy words of international justice, doing the right thing, human dignity, all, all are applicable. Um, and I, last year in the presence of the, the great one, um, uh, Director General, I criticized the UN, and I criticized earlier, and I, uh, nothing was thrown at me, so um, he has some great ideas. Uh, the UN system was created by the victors of World War II, and it was never meant to be, uh, I'm no UN expert, but it was never meant to be a vehicle for justice or keeping security, it was more for keeping, for keeping stability. Uh, and in its current form, given the Syria situation or any place else, um, it is highly dysfunctional, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm in good terms uh, still. So we're, we're okay. Uh, so I think, but I think we need we need to do something about the UN system because the global governance. Um, well, I think I know it's a tall order. There is no other mechanism of, of fixing our global. I mean, how how can how on, how on earth can we allow 400,000 dead in Syria, 12 million refugees internally and externally? Um, and still be able to sleep. I mean, that is, that is h horrific. Uh, and that is a, a result of the dysfunctionality of the global system. Uh, I have no answers for that, but hopefully somebody smarter uh, must have an answer at some point. Otherwise, it's, the world's gonna get more messy. And with these populist movements, which are reactionary, counter-liberal, counter-globalization, uh, identity preservation uh, exercises, um, it's going to get a little messy, I think, uh, in the next decade or two, unless um, more sane minds uh, come through. Um, so the world is too connected, uh, too interdependent uh, to get away with nonsensical uh, political paradigms, no matter how justified. Um, so innovation in the face of a constant human nature in the face of an instantly connected world is useful because we recognize that the state can't do everything. And this was the reason for creating the prize, was really the state is not able to be everywhere and do everything. Uh, last year's winner was very useful. It was a simple app um, to look at children uh, in, in conflict zones. Uh, very useful stuff. Uh, and we must not, never underestimate the value of the slightest bit of innovation, uh, because it all adds up at the end of the day. The state it, it cannot do everything. Uh, it has other priorities. Um, I think I'll stop here.